on to um, Steve Fenske, who's got, gosh, he's ready to go. Junk drawer of questions and tech options. So, um, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> Steve, thank you guys. Take it away, Steve. And Steve, we're not hearing you. Um, you're unmuted on my end. There we go. That's my second go. mute. I always get you caught by it. the second mute. Thanks All right. Well, what I said was thank you, Petra. It was very yeah. good. And I listened in and, and uh, very, very good information. Thank you. Um, I am going to try and make up time for you folks. And Leslie, I want to make sure you can see the presentation. Yes. We can see it. We've also have um, about 224 people on the call, just so folks know. Fantastic. OK, oh, yeah. so here we go. All right. So imagine this. We've got um all of a sudden you're doing the, the finances and and you realize something is not right something is not working uh something doesn't add up and you're six hundred and fifty thousand dollars short that's not a little thing right okay and they start looking into it and 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 somebody says no something's really wrong here something's really bad here and then you start getting state agencies and the fbi investigating what's going on um and shortly after you have a, a, a township clerk and, and they're indicted for federal wire fraud. And we don't have to imagine really because this is the actual situation going on in a township right now. Uh, this, this is a case in process. So we don't know what's going on. We're not saying anybody's guilty or not guilty here, but it raises some really big questions. It raises some questions of how could this have happened? Um, and in this, this particular situation, it was $650,000 over eight years. How could that happen? Well, they didn't follow basic internal controls. They were trusting each other, which is wonderful, except that your job is not to uh, first trust each other. It is, it is to make sure you're, you're doing these tasks that you have to do. And the clerk and the treasurer play important roles in that. And I know that's part of your discussions today that you've had. So I wanted to touch base on a couple things that um, are, are good practices, and some of them are going to be review. Some of them are going to be things where, yeah, we, we know that. Okay, claims. Of course, with claims, they come in, and everything has to be approved by the supervisors. Everybody knows this. This isn't uh, uh, new, okay? Um, in this situation that they had, that clerk had ended up asking people for pre-signatures, okay? And she would say, well, this is going to be used for this town expense and and they said oh yeah i know what that is and, and they sign and they trust and well it turns out she wouldn't write the check for that item she would write it to herself or write it for some expense of her own okay uh, or at times checks would be forged well even if somebody did that all of that could and should have been caught because when we look at a claims process we shouldn't think of it as one meeting just it's presented to the supervisors they approve it it gets signed and done right? That's not the end of the story. The end of each claims story, and I, and I like Petra's, uh, the claim grows up, and, and that, that last one was the disbursement. I'm going to add one more. I'm going to add in the next month, you guys go through a bank record, and you, you match each check, each claim that was approved, and the amount. Did it show up there? What was the check number? If it was there, great. Check off, easy, okay? And this is, in large part, a supervisor duty, but I know they're going to look to clerks and treasurers, okay? And, and it's important for you guys to do this too. Um, anytime you find something that, well, it's not there, okay? Somebody could contact the vendor. It hasn't been claimed. It's not a problem yet. Uh, they may have just been hanging on to a check. That's unusual for businesses though. They like money in, it's cashed, it's theirs. They don't want any monkey business with that money, right? So um, it's unusual. Now, if you do see something that, that doesn't add up, now you have to start looking into it and investigating it. And it doesn't have to be the board alone. This could be the clerk and or the treasurer, okay? Um, and Sue, thanks for the question. I, I will try to catch questions here as we go a little bit too, okay? Um, investigate it, find out what happened. And usually it's just clerical mistake or, or disagreement and, and the records, um, don't reflect what actually happened and well, why is that? And then you have to reconcile what's actually done with your books, right? 
reviewing the petty cash, or I'm happy to hear uh, uh, Petra mention that as well. That's something that flies under the radar a lot of times, but it's there and it's still something to be looked at and, and added into the accounts. Um, depending on the township, the treasurer uh, sometimes is more or less engaged in the financials. Some clerks are exceptionally good at what they do, right? And they're very gung-ho to do everything. And that's a great attitude, except that in, in, as a duty, this financial stuff falls first to the treasurer. And so the treasurer really does have to be engaged and involved in this because if something's wrong, it leads back to the treasurer, all right? Um, at least in part, or at least questions for that treasurer. So working together is excellent and we recommend that. And for those of you with Madit insurance, you'll find that recently the, the trustees there decided they think it's so important that uh, if you have a financial issue, well, you had better had both clerk and treasurer doing separate books and reconciling, because if not, they're not going to extend coverage on certain financial issues. Basically to say, we know how to do this. You know how to do this too. And while it may not be fun to go through these, it's really important to go through them. So we don't end up with a half a million dollar claim of what happened to this money. So these are important steps. Please go through them. Um, we're happy to talk with supervisors about this too. This is, this is as much a supervisor issue. They have to watch that money as they're kind of the guardians of that money too. Um, in this, I like to think of the treasurer as the primary. The clerk, you are a backstop. Um, that comes to check signing, that comes to doing the books. And, and I know it feels like you're gonna do the same thing. So you're, so you're equally in place. But when I say the primary, I mean based on statute. That really falls to the treasurer's lane, if you will. Okay. So the things I've listed here are uh, good practices to go through and carefully monitor to make sure something like this doesn't happen to you. And the advantage is when you get to the end of the year, and we're going to touch on board of audit later, but you're going to be in a better position in your board of audit than if you had done nothing through the year. All right. So here we go with our board of audit. All right, these are the supervisor duties and, and the board of audit is the supervisors, right? But they need some information to do it. And what I've done here is I've listed what the supervisors are supposed to do. And the, the key thing is they're supposed to produce a report. I suspect they're not actually producing a report. I suspect in most towns, it's the clerk and the treasurer and their financial reports that are run for the supervisors and they adopt them as their report. But that couldn't be the end of it. If you look at the statute, there's these other things that the, the board is supposed to note uh, statement of affairs with an estimate for next year. Well, that's not just what do we do this past year. They have to do something extra and say, here's what we'd like in the budget next year for the voters, right? Or examine the other claims that couldn't be audited and give summary. Well, what are those? So they have something more to do. And, and again, that falls to supervisors. That's in their lane. They'll need you to help, okay? And that's why the statutes for the treasurer and for the clerk do mention that board of audit directly. Okay. So for the treasurer, this is provide. Okay. The, the action words for your, your clerk and the treasurer are collect, maintain, organize, provide, give. These are the things you guys do. And, and that's what we have here for the treasurer, provide the account uh, with the, the treasurer's information uh, to the board of audit. Likewise, the, the clerk is doing a similar role. Okay. So uh, probably no surprise there, but what I'm pointing at is you're providing information. It's the supervisors who have to take that and do something with it and produce something with it. So I don't want you to feel that all of that is on your shoulders because they really have to share in that. And yes, it is something we teach supervisors too. I often get that question. Okay. Um, I'm going to take a question from Donna here. When the clerk and the treasurer meet to review the monthly financials, does this fall under the open meeting rule? No, it does not, Donna. The clerk and the treasurer are not subject to the open meeting law. Uh, in their roles as clerk and treasurer, all right? Um, they don't need to be recorded. They don't have minutes or anything like that. Uh, you guys just get together and you do what you need to do for this. Now, if the clerk and the treasurer were put on a committee, if, you're, if your township creates a financial subcommittee of some sort and they appoint the clerk and the treasurer as part of the subcommittee, Yes, that's now a body of government, a subcommittee of, of the town government, and they would be subject to the open meeting law when acting for that. Now, that's pretty rare. You don't see that very often. Occasionally you see a clerk that's appointed to the planning commission or something, and well, then they're, they're subject to open meeting for the planning commission, not because they're a clerk, 
Okay, but good news for clerks and treasurers, the open meeting law does not apply to you. You just sit back and watch the supervisors uh, uh, and how they manage that open meeting law. Thank you, Leslie. All right, annual meeting, clerk duties. Uh, clerks have a big role here. And, and uh, what I tried to do is grab things from different statutes because at the end of chapter 365, there's a bunch of things for, for clerks to do and they're not in one convenient place. So I tried to give you a slide with your duties in statute in one spot so that you could take this if nothing else and say, here's what I have to do uh, as, a, as a baseline with the annual meeting. And again, I don't think these are surprising. It's just a convenience here. Uh, you give your published notice. The alternative notice uh, is, is available if the board or the voters say you can give alternative. And that's where you just post the notice. But because we really want people to come to this, these open meetings and get engaged in town government, we recommend you give all the notices you can. Publish, post, call local media and get them to announce. Um, MAT has run advertisements at times. Uh, Leslie, who you've heard from today, had a huge role in promoting the annual meeting this past year. Uh, that, that annual meeting, I forget the report, but we were in, I think, uh, several dozen local news outlets to get the word out about the annual meeting. That's what we want to do. And that's why we think giving that notice is really important. Um, clerks, you have a phenomenal power in a snowstorm. Uh, this is our second bullet here. If, if you have inclement weather and it is not safe for people to come to the polls or for the annual meeting, you as the clerk, uh, you are delegated the power to postpone it. It's not a board decision. This is a very unusual piece of law, okay? But because you have a lot of duties related to the annual meeting, this is given to you. You do have to make the decision at least three hours before and you don't get to reconvene on a date of your choice. It's in that statute through 6551 that says uh, you have two options. There's the first day. And then if that day is also an inclement weather day, you have the last option, but there's really no, no choice in that matter. It's just a, do we hold it now or do we hold it on one of the alternative dates given in statute? The call to order for the annual or special town meeting. Uh, you have that where you begin this meeting. And, and so for a moment, it's, you're kind of the moderator for a moment. And I think that's important. To, to give a process where the voters decide their moderator, because they're gonna select their moderator. But we wanna make sure that has good due process. Okay, we're not talking like a constitutional claim. We're not gonna see a big issue about this, but it's about trust in government. Uh, trust in, well, what about the annual meeting if uh, if somebody kind of just takes over? And, I, and we actually had a story about this this past year. Uh, township, uh, they tried to meet in person. Uh, some folks got there early and they decided that, well, this just isn't big enough for, our, for all the people we think we're gonna get. And they just kind of decided to move it outside. And well, it was probably fine, but you know, they didn't really have that opportunity. They didn't really have that authority to do that. Um, so the clerk, you do have some, some um, responsibility in maintaining order at the beginning of that town meeting, at least till they get a moderator. And if you don't like that, that's of course, you know, reason to, to find a moderator quickly and hand it off. Um, Alicia, I hope I'm saying that right. Our local radio station has an operation snow desk. Could I use that to postpone our elections annual meeting if weather deems necessary? You could certainly use their information or if this is a posting place, you would, um, you could use them to try and get the word out. So I guess one of the things you might want to have is kind of a plan. What, it, what would we do in that bad weather situation? Who do I contact? and have that ready to go rather than trying to get on your phone or online and, and figure out, oh, what's the local radio station's phone number and, and something like that. So that would be a, a probably a pretty uh, good choice to do, Alicia. All right, Nancy and Sue, those are kind of different topics. So I'm gonna come back to them as we get later down here, okay? All right, keep minutes of the town meeting. So th this is a statute where the, the clerk actually has a duty to take the minutes. And that, that is for the town meeting and a, and a town meeting is of the voters and a board meeting is of the board. So this is one of those where, yeah, the clerk actually is supposed to sit there and take them. Uh, if the clerk isn't there, you could of course use a deputy who could stand in the shoes of the clerk. And the, the statute provides if neither of those is available, the members there select their clerk the same as they select their moderator. The last one is where we get the most questions. The minutes of the annual meeting. Well, statute says that these must be signed by the clerk and by the moderator. 
within two days of the meeting, all right? So not, that would give you the day of the meeting and the two days following. And then they're filed with the clerk, okay? And we always get, well, when are they official? Don't they have to be approved at the following annual meeting? Because every year at the annual meeting, the voters consider their former minutes and they, they approve them. Doesn't that mean they're approved at that time? Uh, the answer here is no, because the statute tells us they're filed, they're, they're effective for the town board when they're signed by those two people within two days. And think this through a little bit. We have the town, the town meeting with the voters. And at some point after that, and before the next assembly of voters, the town board has to take those minutes and either do something or not do something, or they certainly have to report a levy based on it. So in those situations, we're, we're not really saying that those minutes need to be approved. We're saying they're the best we have in this system. And as long as they clearly tell the board what they're supposed to do or allowed to do, and they report a levy, that's good enough. They're done. Okay. Now the voters at the next annual meeting, they can consider them and approve them. Uh, if they want to make changes, do not change the original document. Okay. That is, that is gospel now. Okay. That's your record of that thing that happened and that's done. And if they want to make a change, you make a change as an addendum and then attach it to that, to that set of minutes. Okay. We don't, we don't go changing the original because that's important to know what was the board acting on for that full year between the time that the voters first, you know, made these actions and then they were approved. The next piece that's questionable is, well, how do we know who was in that last meeting? You may have a record, uh, uh, sometimes you do, but do we have even the same people? Do we even have a quorum of the people who were at that meeting? They may not know at all what that last meeting did. It doesn't really make a lot of sense when we add that up. And that's why here they're official and reliable and used within those two days after you sign them. Ah, oh, Carrie, can our recording secretary take minutes? If so, do I still need to sign the minutes? Okay, Carrie, so you have somebody who's going to do this work for you. I would say it is your duty to ensure it gets done then. Yeah, but if you have somebody who's actually going to perform the work for you, that is acceptable. And that would be just fine. The point being, when it comes down to it, you have to, you have to have minutes ready to go. So, you know, if you're sitting there with the recording secretary and they're taking the minutes, that's just fine, okay? You're going to see them, use them, uh, make any changes you and the moderator deem necessary, and then uh, get them filed, okay? In other words, you still have to have a hand in it. You can't hand it off. Okay. Back to my other window here. All right. Notary powers are something that continues to be vexing for, for clerks. Uh, excellent, cool power here. When you are officially the clerk, meaning you have received your certificate of election and, or appointment, and you have taken your oath of office, you are a notary public. It's the same thing as a notary public. It's just, you're called a notary ex officio, which means by office. Okay, no difference between you and a notary public, although you shouldn't charge for, for signatures, okay, uh, shouldn't charge for, for doing this, but it means your, your ability to receive oaths or notarize documents and signatures is not limited to the township, okay, you can do this for anyone out in the community that you want to, it's not something that you're limited to only with the township, all right. It is something that the clerk alone holds as a notary ex officio. And the way the statute reads, it's not transferred to the deputy clerk, even when the deputy is standing in the shoes of the clerk. For this reason, we recommend that, that the town board uh, pay for and allow the deputy clerk to become a notary public. So that if you don't have your clerk available, notary ex officio, you still have a notary available to take oaths and uh, notarize documents as needed. Okay, this is a backup. It's a little hole in the law. And, and that's why we think it's important that your deputies get this certification, all right? Uh, the statute gives you the, the language for your stamp or signature first, signature, A, B is you, okay? Your, your name, uh, put in your, you know, um, Stanton Township Clerk of which county, Minnesota, Notary Public, uh, term is indeterminate. And this raises a, a concern for some folks, the term issue. 
as an officer in town, in a township, you don't have an end date on your office. Now, certainly if you're an appointed clerk, an option B clerk or treasurer, you have no expiration date. You, you serve at the pleasure of the board of supervisors. But even if you're elected, you don't have an end date. In, in a March election situation, uh, you, you know, you'll probably, if somebody else is elected or you resign or, or you're retiring, that you're going to uh, leave, leave office within a matter of uh, 10 to, to maybe up to 25 days, something like that, okay? But there's a piece in the law that says uh, you serve until a successor is elected and qualified. So let's say the person elected declines the office and they don't wanna hold the office. And the supervisors, well, gosh, they're trying, but, but they can't find anybody who wants to take this job, okay? You remain the clerk or for the treasurers, you remain the treasurer because your, let, your successor hasn't been elected and qualified or appointed, we would place here and qualified, okay? So we end up with an indeterminate date for your office. Even in a March, uh, a uh, November situation, we have an expected date that people take office in January. But if they don't, that doesn't mean the clerk and the treasurer are done and, and that township is out of luck, okay? It means you just hang tight until they replace you. This should not be used to keep you in office indefinitely for the criminal masterminds among you. Uh, don't do that. Uh, in that case, talk to us, talk to your town attorney and we'll craft a solution that, that gives recognition to this fact that, well, we can't find somebody, you're still in office, but we wanna give some effect to the intent of the voters. Okay, to keep that public trust again, all right. Uh, Debbie, I am the clerk in notary public, paid the 125, can the treasurer then be a notary officer? These are separate issues, Debbie. So when you, if you were already a notary public, when you became the clerk, that's fine. You could use either commission, your, your notary public commission or your clerk's notarial power, okay, ex officio. But the, the issue of the treasurer is separate. You can't transfer the ex officio power to a different officer. This is held specifically by the clerk, non-transferable, okay? Not even to your deputy, so certainly not to the treasurer. If they want the treasurer to be a notarial officer, they would need to uh, pay for it with the, uh, the 125 to the Secretary of State. Okay. And Carrie, do I need to sign them in addition to the recording secretary? And here, I'm sorry, Carrie, we're back on the minutes for the annual meeting. Yes, Carrie, the, the statute says the clerk signs them, okay? Now, if it's the deputy clerk who took them, I would have the deputy clerk sign them. It is effectively meaning the clerk of the meeting, all right? So if you're doing the minutes and you're there, I don't think we can hand it off to anybody. You need to still be uh, in the end responsible for this if you're there, okay? If you're using somebody to help you, that's fine, but you're gonna end up signing them as your representation because this is the part of public trust. The public selected you or you were appointed by your board. So there's a legal process saying you are special holding that office and we want your signature to determine that this is correct. All right, what has to be in a resignation letter if one resigns over pay? Um, a, a statement of the person that they resign the office of town supervisor, clerk, treasurer, whatever they're resigning and the effective date and that is all. They, uh, it's, it's important to try and get a resignation letter uh, as part of the process, it is not imperative. We could move on without it, okay? But uh, that's all you would absolutely need. Name, effective date and the office they're resigning from. Digitally recording meetings. Okay, um, you're not required to digitally record meetings. It's a possibility for you if you would like to. Uh, there's two ways to approach it. If it's the clerk recording digitally for the purpose of making the minutes later or making the minutes accurate later, uh, you take them and then they're used only for that purpose and then you would delete them, okay? And for those of you screaming about data retention, fine, note it that you're, you're making this recording for this purpose and then it's going to be removed all right if you're keeping it as part of the record that's fine you can do that a lot of townships and other governments do that and and you're going to make that recording and you're going to keep it long term pursuant to your data retention schedule um, now 
in that case, you sometimes end up with situations where the minutes don't seem to reflect what the minutes reflect. That can be for a variety of legitimate reasons, okay? The recording is not a substitute for the minutes because the minutes are the very purposeful act of the board saying, here's what we're doing and why we're doing it, which may not come out very well in a recording. It, it, could, it could sound to someone like, well, I thought we were leading in this direction, but when it came down to it, no, they understood it differently because what was said isn't necessarily what's going on in their head, okay? So be cautious about use of minutes. Uh, our, the best advice, talk to your township attorney about whether you and the, the attorney think it's appropriate for your township to record every meeting. Uh, could the deputy clerk sign minutes when done by the deputy clerk and the clerk can notarize the signatures? Douglas, I'm not positive of when you mean. If you're talking about the annual meeting, the deputy clerk stands in the shoes of the clerk and so that person could sign them. They do not need a notarization after that, okay? Um, notarizing it doesn't add anything at that point. Um, it's just a cool use of your power, I guess, uh, in that case. Um, clerk, if you're going to be there, you're going to be involved, you should, should state that you understand them, you agree with them, unless you weren't there and you can't speak to their authenticity or accuracy. All right. So if we do November elections, we don't put an expiration date on an ex officio stamp. That is my recommendation, but I'm told there's pushback by some stamp producers and, and uh, possibly the Secretary of State's office that they want you to have an expiration date, okay? If, you, if they insist upon this, and this is the only way to get this stamp, fine. Put a date down, but put it down well after the time that you expect to be done, because we don't want your town to be without that power, if needed, in that gap time, that interim time. All right, this sounds like a great way to just make people buy more stamps to me, all right? More than it's about any law, okay? Um, you're now the stamp over you, notarial officer, not notary public, okay? You have all the same powers, it's just a different label and different way you got it, okay? Um, we'll move on from that one. Okay, oath of office. Every person, I'm not going to read all this. Basically, every person elected in each term, whether, they, whether they're re-elected or elected for the first time, takes a new oath. And that's probably not a surprise to a lot of people. You guys have done this many times. Uh, for those of you who happen to have not been doing it, please start doing it. Administer the oath to every person, okay, every time. Uh, you know, you can have your third inaugural here for each person if they're, they're on their third term or whatever you want to call it here. But uh, it's important to do and the statute is listed here for, for two reasons. One, to remind you to do it, but two, it notes if taken before the town clerk, well, that tells us something, okay? It means it doesn't have to be the town clerk. And sometimes uh, the town clerk isn't available. Occasionally, the town clerk doesn't wanna be in the same room as the person who won an election, okay? Fine, we don't need that person. All right, there's alternatives. And, and our alternatives are first, any notarial officer. So any notary public, okay? Uh, that could mean the clerk in a neighboring township. It could mean a city clerk because they're a notary ex officio as well. It could mean a, a banker that wants to, you know, happens to be a notary and wants to, to administer an oath for you. Uh, it could be another elected officer or appointed officer. And I've given the statutes here, and this is one overlooked, but any person who holds a, an office in the state, a state or local government office, is empowered to administer oaths for the duties of that office. And so it would fall within this that, okay, uh, I'm a supervisor and, and we have a new treasurer and the clerk just isn't here right now. Uh, we don't have to do an oaths in the meetings. That's not required at all, okay? So I can administer this oath because it's related to my township business, all right? Uh, you have a lot of flexibility with this. The important piece though, is that the oath documents and, and once it's done, gets filed with the clerk. That does have to be done. So it goes into the township records, okay? Um, newly appointed clerk, how do I go about getting the required notary set up? I believe, the Secretary of State has some resources to point you to things, but otherwise, I believe most office supply stores can, can do this for you, or you could just go online 
and you can order notarial stamps, I believe that way as well. And you may have to show your uh, certificate of election or appointment in your case. They, they take different precautions, but in the end, this is just a stamp. We're, we're giving an awful, awful lot of credibility to a stamp, right? So um, follow the directions of, of whatever group you work with. If one's too difficult to work with, find a different one. See what, see what it's gonna take. Um, this would be a township expense that you should pass along to the board because uh, you're, you can sign things for the township for a limited time uh, before you get your stamp. There is a, a, a time where it recognizes you won't have a stamp and you can still do oaths and, and um, uh, recognize signatures until you get it, but it is limited. So um, there should be a lot of options available for you. Is it okay for the clerk to keep the notary stamp till it expires before I purchase my stamp or do I have to get a notary stamp? I became, I became it in 2000, 2020. So Lori, you should have a new stamp because it'll have to have your name on it and saying that you're the notarial officer. Um, and and so, so you wouldn't be able to use somebody else's stamp, I think is what you're saying. Prior treasurer becomes the deputy same for the clerk. So, so clerk and treasurer are now the deputy clerk and treasurer respectively. They were sworn in for their previous positions. Do they need to retake the oath as a deputy? Yes. So Travis, anytime a person enters a new office, they take a new oath of office. All right. Uh, do elected officials need to do an oath even if they're reelected? Yes, Jenna. Every single time a person takes, uh, 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 starts a new term, or is appointed to something new or different, okay? Or they're reappointed to the same position, we need to do the oath of office again. There's a gentleman in Southern Minnesota who had been on his board for like 60 years. He was a clerk, he had taken the oath 30 times, okay? It may sound silly, may not feel special the 30th time anymore, but uh, it is important to do. It is part of the process to properly enter office. For those of you who are in the new officer training yesterday, you've heard all about that. Uh, if you don't, you're impersonating a public official and they're gonna come arrest you, chuck you in jail with all the other town officers. Uh, Denise, and, and I'm joking folks, No, uh, almost no township officers are in jail, okay? Uh, I can't say all. In a local township, they have a clerk that is not in their township because no one wanted the position. Now there's someone interested in the clerk isn't posting the position when is it the year that it should be open for new candidates to file when the new person, when can this new person get this resolved? Okay, Denise, there's some issues here with, uh, first of all, if the nature of the office is elected, clerk or treasurer, it must be from the township. And if we're, and if that is not the case, we have a bigger problem and you should give us a call and talk about that. If they have an option B, clerk or treasurer, where it's appointed, the voters have allowed their clerk or treasurer to become appointed, this is just fine, they could either fire the current person and hire the person in the township or the voters could uh, revert back from option B and go back to an, an elected position. Um, give us a call. We'll talk through this because there's some funny stuff going on here that we want to check on. If we're appointed clerk and deputy clerk, do we have to take, oh, I'm sorry, Lottie, I already got that one for you. Keep taking the oath. Each time you start a new office, uh, 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 start a new term, or you change offices, okay? When in doubt, just take the oath. That's a good, a good way to put it. All right, moving on. Post-election issues, Board of Canvas. Everybody should be doing a Board of Canvas. Uh, this is a supervisor function. Uh, they are reviewing a summary. That's what I mean by abstract or report, a summary of what was going on. They do not review ballots. They do not handle ballots. I have written pro forma review. You will not find that in the statute. That is my my opinion, my belief that this is pretty much a pro forma review because there's nothing in that statute about what do you do if you don't agree with it? Well, there's nothing. I, I mean, maybe you could start an errors and omissions lawsuit, but you still have this duty in the statute to perform the duties of the board of canvas within a certain time period, right? As the, as the supervisors. So, and this is a clerk function to bring that abstract or report Okay, and we'll make sure that the, the election judges have completed it and can provide it, right? That's the connection here, okay? But if there's a problem or disagreement, there isn't a solution. And, and somebody can contest an election, but their ability to do that depends on it being canvassed, depends on it being uh, official as an official re result here, okay? So in this, they're probably gonna have to just approve the abstract 
assuming there's not some some issue of counting, okay, and then let somebody challenge uh, the election under Chapter 209 as, as they are entitled to do, or even the board as, as voters could do it, okay? But um, that's probably what they're going to end up having to do. The deeper point here for clerks is what you have to do after the board of canvas, and it is issue the certificate of election. Carl and I sat here and tried to work out funny ways to break this, this statute and make things happen in odd ways. And, and I think we've got a summary here that is correct. The earliest in a March election that your certificates of election could go out is nine days after the date of the election. Okay. And that's if the eighth day, the last day, is not a Saturday or Sunday or legal holiday. Okay. Because there's a statute saying when any of those are the last day of a period, you, you can't count them and we have to skip to the next business day, usually the next Monday, right? Okay. And this also assumes that the board did their canvas on the election day. And that you hold your, your seven day contest period. That's how we get to that number, okay? This is a rule of thumb. There are weird things that can happen depending on the year and depending on the date, okay? Uh, there is no latest day available. And this is because if they don't um, canvas until much later, for, for example, a township board who didn't think they had to canvas, they didn't pay attention to it and they didn't post a meeting. Well, they have to post a meeting. So now you know we're five days out from when they realize that and post it. And then we have our contest period. And then the clerk is supposed to issue the thing. But what if they don't? Well, that's how we end up with no let last day available here. Okay, November, we've done a similar, uh, similar type of look here. We believe the earliest date is 11 days after the election. This is a for the certificate. Okay, if the 10th is not the Saturday, Sunday or legal holiday, assumes canvas is three days, the first day available, okay, that, that you could do the canvas. And we have our seven day uh, period there. And again, no latest day available. Okay. Uh, Alicia, is it illegal to issue the certificate election earlier than nine days after? I would think so because assuming you did your canvas the night of, okay, so you have a two, uh, two days, within two days of the election to canvas, let's say they did it the night of, okay, now you have to have a seven day contest period that must start the next day, it can't start the same day, okay. And, and that's why we are out that far, okay? Um, so I think you, I think if we, if we did our counting right here, you should be at least nine days out. And again, if this is not quite right, um, nobody's going to jail, okay? This is, we, we try to aim for the correct answer here, but um, there's, there's human error, there's some counting issues, there's some stuff that goes on with that. Just clarifying, deputy clerks who were hired by town board needs to take the oath of office too. Yes, that is correct. No matter how they got into their office, election, appointment, um, uh, option B always appointed, it doesn't matter. They must take the oath of office because once they hold that position, it's a public trust. And that oath is their promise to the public that they will discharge the duties according to law. Clarify November supervisor election when the oath of office and when the organization meeting takes place. Okay, so the oath of office after November election, they couldn't begin discharging their duties until I believe it's the first Tuesday after the first Monday, I think it's is how it's written. But in any event, it's in early January, Nancy, when the new, new person could start exercising their duties. Some townships administer the oath before then with the understanding that they can't actually carry out the duties. I'm, uh, that's not the, the safest way, the best way to do it. The best way to do it is wait till the, at least the day of when they could begin discharging their duties or a day after and then have the oath done, okay? But I don't think there's gonna be a problem likely if they administer it in, in December or something, okay? It's, it's the same promise, it's just we're saying, well, it couldn't be effective until January. A reorganization meeting is whenever you guys want to do it. We just recommend you do it after the, uh, uh, the first new board is there. So they have an understanding with each other of how they're going to operate. Um, and they don't get into to habits and then decide not to do it. So that, that's really up to you guys. There's no law about it. That's a best practice. Moving on. Payments to election judges. Um, this is a confusing topic. I think the summary, I'll go through this, but I think the summary is just do W-2s, okay? Um, the, 
this is going to be the easy way to do it. Just do W-2s from the start. Don't try to put it through claims and then try to fix it later in the year. The easiest thing through this is to give election judges W-2s. I believe that's the summary, okay? Deadline for swearing in, David. Um, sorry, I'll, I'll go back here. There's not a deadline. There is no latest date. The new officers must take their oath within 10 days of them receiving their certificate of election. So it could be earlier or it could be much later depending on when they receive that certificate of election. All right, um, election judges. So all election judges are employees, employees, employees. They are never ever contractors. There's no possibility that they could be a contractor. Okay, they're your employee. So that puts them in certain boxes here. The, the documents, I know Patrick touched on these. I'm not gonna go through them because you already did them. So we can make up some time here. The withholding rules are here at the bottom, okay? And now your notes will say um, a little different here because I updated it for 2021. All right, now if they're over 600 in payments to an election judge, you must give them a W-2, all right? But because of how this works later on, it makes sense to just do a W-2 no matter what, okay? That seems the easiest way rather than trying to go back later and send it uh, if you need to at a later time, okay? If they happen to be over 1900 and we're in 2021 here for this, this rule, then you also have to with, withhold taxes for them, okay? And, and you could do that for a lower amount. It's just if you don't, well, they're going to have to pay their tax when they go do their taxes, okay? Because none of it is tax-free ever. It's not like it's, oh, under 1900, it's, it's tax-free. No, it is not. They're just going to have to pay it later. I think the kind thing to do for them is do the withholding so they don't have any adverse tax effect on them. The money is there. If anything, they'll get a refund, but they shouldn't owe money because of this. All right. Uh, may withhold under, I'm sorry, this should be 1900, but it is not required. And this is where I'm saying it seems the easier way to go about this. Okay. And this rule is the general rule for people who are not town officers or employees because they often receive more money from these other sources and that messes with these amounts, okay? So this is the generic rule for those who are not town officers or employees. All right. Reporting payments to attorneys. I mentioned this only because the reporting form claimed uh, uh, or changed this past year. So now you're gonna do this on a 1099 NEC, which is a non-employee compensation. And you'll get a document from the from the attorney saying uh, this is their, their what's called W nine, and you just match up the boxes. Okay, this is a very simple one. It's just it used to go on a ten ninety nine general form, and, but but they're not doing it after the tax changes last year. So it looks like I have another question here. Election judges never make over six hundred, so I still need to do a W two. No, you don't have to, Kathy. We're saying the kind thing, the better thing is for you to just do it this way. So they get it because you have to report it no matter what on your year end, your, your township's year end statement. It's the 941 or the 944. And so no matter what, it's going to get reflected there. So it's not like it's tax free to them. There'll be a, a record that they made this money. Okay. And, and so you still have to do this. They still get reporting here. Okay. It's just seems easier to do this all the same way, no matter who it is. And if you're using CTAS, this is done pretty easily, as I understand it with the withholding, because it, it just goes into the employment module and the taxes are withhold or withheld. And then they, they get their W-2, it's done, okay? Speaking about election judges who are also town officers and withholding FICA. Yeah, okay, Karen, that's where, that's where it gets into different answers and we're gonna have to take that give it to me in an email or give a call and we'll go through that. I don't want to go into the rules with the town officers and employees because they get other money. So chances are you're going to end up having to do it as a W-2 anyway, because they're already making over that 600 for the township or over the 1900 where you had to withhold anyway. So it's just rolled into it. Okay. All right, so we actually have to create a 1099 for any attorney fees that we have paid. That appears to be the rule, and it's the 1099 NEC in particular. It's a separate from the general 1099, the 1099 NEC. I took a look at it the other day. It is not long. It looks very similar to what they did before. So uh, it, it just a new, it's like a new form. Uh, I don't know why the old form was bad, but here we are. 
uh, that's the federal government, right? Okay, communications. Um, scheduling board meetings is a supervisor job, all right? It is not a clerk and treasurer job. You could certainly uh, um, help them with that if you want to, and that's fine. And then there's a practice of that. And, and part of that is so they could try and avoid the open meeting law, but supervisors can talk to each other to set up a meeting. That doesn't violate the open meeting law because how could you have a meeting if you never were able to talk about when you could meet, all right? And, and that's okay. They can do that if they want to. They could do it by written response and that way it's very clear what was said or not said. And if it's just about scheduling, no issues, okay? Um, Point being, you can help them if you want. If not, that's fine, they can do it. Just be aware of them trying to use you for chain meetings where they pass information between themselves through you. It's the wheel and spoke or what's called chain meeting. In any event, it's not acceptable. It's been tried, it's been, it's been rejected. So um, be aware of that. All right, going back to payments, Alicia, if our township has always been paid quarterly, am I correct in understanding now under new employment law, we need to be paid monthly. That is correct. Well, depends on who we're paying. If we're talking about officers, no. Town officers are not employees under the wage theft law for their supervisor duties, for their clerk or treasurer duties. So for those, you could do it quarterly. But if you have any employees or you have officers who are doing employment type of work, then yes, you need to do monthlies at the very least to comply with the wage theft law. Um, if you just have three supervisors, a clerk and the treasurer, and you're and they're all doing typical uh, uh, jobs related to their elected or appointed function, we don't need to worry about the wage theft law. It could, you could continue doing quarterlies in that event. All right. Agenda and public packet agenda is not required, and this is just incomprehensible for some folks, but there's no law requiring it. You could use it or don't use it. You could change it mid-meeting. There is no binding precedent to this thing in a board meeting. There's an exception in the annual meeting where it says the vote on the levy must be taken in the order listed by the moderator. Okay, but that's the only time we see this anywhere. The closest we get to it is on a special meeting. And some people say, well, if I'm gonna do a special board meeting, I have to give the date, time, location, and I gotta list the business we're gonna do. And they say, well, isn't that the agenda? Not necessarily, okay? The agenda could be more specific than, than the generic statement to give the public notice of what's going on in that meeting, okay? So it may overlap, it may be the same, okay? If it overlaps or, or you think it's the same here in a special board meeting, one that's not on their regular schedule, then yeah, you have an agenda from the standpoint of you have to stay in these, these topics that you put in your meeting notice, but that's the only thing you're doing there, okay? You could change the order of it and, or, or create subs within the same topic, and that's okay even within that, okay? So an agenda is not required for regular board meetings. See, Denise, this is what I'm saying. I just said it, and you don't believe me, right? Because this is incomprehensible to people. You don't need an agenda. It is not required, okay? So everybody got that? Not required. I know you, you can use it, go ahead, okay? Because you're freaking out that you don't have to use an agenda. Um, go ahead if you want to. It's just no one's getting in trouble and no law is violated by not using it or changing it, okay? And it is not your job or your problem to create the agenda. This is a supervisor problem if they want one for their meeting, it's their agenda, it's their issue to deal with. If they, if they have this, you can of course help but it is not your responsibility, okay? Clerks though, whatever they do, uh, you have to give that meeting packet, the public packet of the information that the board um, received for the meeting that they're gonna use during the meeting, okay? And there might be exceptions, things that are private, right? And, and I know Petra touched on that as well about certain data that, no, this is not public. You don't put this out. And there's some things that you'll find with that. Um, certain elements of, of even payroll, okay? Certain things that you don't give out and don't receive. Certain things that may come from an attorney or a professional, uh, professional services that are not going to be public and, and that is acceptable, okay? But the stuff that goes out into the public, yep, go ahead, put it out there and that's okay. All right. Can the public packet have private info redacted? Sue, so some of it could be, it could be that way. 
Uh, it depends on what is going to be private and that's where the clerk has to go look into it. And it, it's, uh, I guess, I wish it were more of a science, but there's some art to it in figuring out what's private and what's not. Um, certain things right on their face are going to be private, bank numbers, social security numbers, uh, attorney information or advice or communications between only one person, for example. Um, if the board as a group didn't get it, okay, well, that's not a board thing. That's one person brought it with them um, and the clerk may not have even had it, put it in the public packet. Likewise, when a member of the public brings something that they want the board to look at or want people to see, the clerk doesn't have that and that's not the clerk's fault, right? So. Uh, when it comes to redaction, yeah, they got to be looking through it careful and they, they can redact certain things. Uh, when someone hoards the public packet or book at the town meeting, what can we do about that? Can we do anything to her? Well, yeah, other people can go and explain, look, that's not yours. You can't just take it. Okay, so when are you done with it? And if it looks like you're no longer reading it, we're going to take it from you. If they protest, explain, look, you're happy to take a picture with your phone. If you really want it, we can arrange to get you a copy later, but other people need to see that and have those other people standing there with you if they're willing. If they're causing a disturbance over it, I would ask them to leave. They're no longer welcome if they're causing a problem, okay? The, the ability to hear and, and see an, an open meeting assumes that you're gonna follow the reasonable rules of the meeting. And one of those would be that something that isn't yours, you can't keep. So if they're not willing to give it back, ask them to leave. If she refuses, then tell them, all right, we're, we're going to pause and call the sheriff. That isn't yours. They're going to take it from you, give it back, and they're going to escort you out. And that might uh, move them forward. The other option, if this is such a problem, I guess print an extra copy. I hate to do that because it prevents or gives the idea that, well, if you're a pain in the ass, we're going to accommodate you instead of having that person act like everybody else acts. Um, but it might be a short-term solution. All right, what types of things are required in the public packet? It's the stuff that the board as a group is going to see and consider for the meeting and talk about. So you wouldn't want like, uh, they're, if they're gonna look at a contract, the contract goes in the public packet if they're gonna go through it because there's nothing private in a contract unless it's, um, uh, there's certain types of information like trade secret, but I've yet to come across a township issue that would have a trade secret in it. Um, it could be something like that. It could be a, a summary of the, the claims. That's important. That's fair to give out. Okay. Don't give out the, the paychecks themselves or the deductions. That's nobody's business. That's private. Okay. That's something that, yeah, people can see the top line of what anybody made and they may be able to see the net in a check, but they shouldn't see the deductions. That's private stuff. All right. I'm going to shift here and keep us, keep us plugging along here. Okay. All right, I object, I'm not signing. I don't wanna sign this check or this claim because I disagree with you. So let's walk through some of these. Most of the time you're gonna end up signing, okay? Your job is not to agree or disagree. Your job is to recognize that the board took this action. So that's what the clerk primarily is doing is saying, yep, I as the clerk recognize that the board as a group took this action. This isn't one supervisor or one, you know, the chairman just deciding to up and sign something. I'm saying they took this as an official action. All right, or the treasurer, uh, your, your signature is there to affirm there is money available in the account to pay this claim and we're not about to, to uh, write a bad check here, okay? That's the general rule. So we have examples, paying a supervisor for contract work without a conflict of interest waiver. You say, oh gosh, he's gonna go operate the plow. Um, that is not something he's elected to do. That should take a conflict of interest waiver and he didn't do one, I'm not signing. No, you should sign, okay? because you're not verifying, you're not, you're not the conflict of interest police, all right? Uh, you just signed to say, yep, the board took this action. You can note your disagreement with it, uh, but in the end, they, they did this action. And it's that supervisor who can have criminal consequences uh, in a statutory conflict of interest issue, all right? So um, you're not the police, there's, there's real police that can go after this conflict of interest issue, all right? Choosing to use a contractor who wasn't the cheapest option. So we're in, in sealed bid territory, let's say, and they don't take the, the cheapest option, okay? That could be for very good reason, fair reason and legal reason, or it could be, well, no, they just don't like that guy because he's from out of town and they, they, they did one that costs more. And I know they're not supposed to do that. They have to take the lowest responsible bidder. Again, don't withhold your signature here. This is this is maybe a different issue that you report to somebody, but you're not going to withhold your signature. All right. 
Um, next, making a donation to Boy Scout Troop. Now I put the Boy Scouts here because lots of people uh, were Scouts or they, they know Scouts and this is a community group that people know and understand. But I can't think of a donation statute that would allow you to give money to them. Okay, Girl Scouts, we could swap in Girl Scouts here. This isn't about gender. It's about, it's a wonderful organization but it still doesn't qualify for a donation. Well, what, what do we do now with this? This could be a, could be one that, uh, that they just disagree, okay? And you'd probably end up signing it, all right? What if though it's a, it's a check to the local, a local business, it's a local convenience store that um, they're falling on hard times and we're gonna give them a loan. Now we're getting into some misuse of public funds territory, okay? But towns don't give loans. That's not what they do. We can't use the public treasury for that. Okay. What about a food shelf? Well, food shelf's okay. There's a statute that allows it. What if you say, well, I disagree. Uh, none of our, our residents use that. That's used by folks in other townships. And I don't think that's a public purpose. All right. No, you, you, this is disagreement. It's not something that's unlawful. And so you end up signing that check. Okay. Uh, supervisor submits a claim for work on days that the clerk knows were not worked. I've got, I've got Facebook photos that he was in Florida. I know he didn't work these days. Yeah, don't sign it yet, okay? Because now we're entering into that territory of uh, embezzlement, theft, or misuse of public funds, okay? And it, you don't have to necessarily say, I won't sign it. It's, wait a minute, I just let's slow down for a minute. I have to check some things. It can be that, okay? And if you think that's what's going on, you can start talking to the, the other supervisors or the chair, okay? Uh, if, if it's a person, one person bringing the check, stop, make some phone calls and find out what other people know. Explain to them what you know. And maybe they, they come to the conclusion, hey, yeah, there is something here, we shouldn't sign this thing or at least not yet, okay? Um, or talk to law enforcement. You could certainly call the county sheriff and ask about that, okay? Um, last, supervisor wants reimbursement for equipment he purchased for the town. He goes out and purchases a bunch of signs and he posts them all over the town. And sorry, folks, if you were here yesterday, it's the same example. Um, <laughs> yeah, but it was unauthorized, let's say. Uh, and he brings a check because he happens to have a, a, a check or he wants reimbursement and the, and the board hasn't, hasn't said yes or no. Well, then no, you don't sign it. The board hasn't done something yet. Okay. Maybe they will adopt it later, even though it wasn't wasn't uh, appropriate in the first place, but maybe they'll adopt the action later and it would be appropriate, but it's a wait kind of moment, okay? Speaking at meetings. All right, I'm gonna try and catch questions uh, when I can here, folks, but we'll, we'll do it at the end because those who are waiting, I, I just wanna make sure we get through the presentation for them and then if they wanna take off, they can. Uh, do you have speaking rights at a meeting? No, you don't. Clerk and treasurer at a board meeting, you don't have a, a, a right. Now the supervisor should work with you. It would be wise usually to include you, but they don't have to. And there are some circumstances where they may not want to. And if you do get to speak, you should be speaking in your role as the clerk or treasurer related to your duties, not as a, uh, a, a super citizen here, okay? A citizen who, yep, you, you know more about this because you're involved in town business, but it's really just your personal opinion. Uh, you, you, you know, you don't want the scrabble pit in the place they're talking about letting it go. Well, that's not really your role as a clerk or treasurer, you're speaking as a resident. And if that's the case, they should be treating you just like they treat any other public comment. And you should be treating yourself like any other public comment. That will help maintain trust in what you're doing and that you're not using your authority to exceed uh, the duties of office or the powers of office, okay? And those are usually bigger, bigger problems if we have that kind of issue. All right, so we're going to switch gears. Uh, technology options. Um, there's not a ton of these. Some are, are a little bit of review from stuff you've seen before, but they're the important ones. First of all, um, what I have noticed in the past number of years is, is the computer options have become cheaper and easier to get than ever before. Um, now, for clerks and treasurers, you should have a Windows machine. Uh, whether you like Apple or you like something else, you should have Windows to run C tests. I'm very sorry. That's what they that's what they run it on. That's primarily what the business world runs on, and you should have that for this purpose. Okay. Um, uh, if you don't like it, I guess run for supervisor, and then you can get a different option. But um, you know, this is important for that, and you guys have seen and heard all the great things that C tests can do. So it's good to have that there. All right. Um, for supervisors. 
you have more options and, and clerks and treasurers here, I'd hope you'd kind of steer them towards this or, or steer them towards these other options. Because for a supervisor, typically all they're doing is emailing, maybe audio or video chat, maybe more so in recent months here with our video meetings, but eventually those are gonna probably go away, right? They may do some basic word processing. They may do some spreadsheets, occasionally a presentation, all right? Maybe they're not gonna do presentations. They don't need PowerPoint. Well. If that's the case, you know, of course there's Windows and, and Apple, but those are typically pretty expensive. You can get cheaper window machines, but the one that has struck me uh, is Chromebooks. I had an opportunity to play around and use one of these last year, and I was really impressed. And it was not a, a really expensive model. Um, it runs off Android, which is the same thing that most most of your phones, if you're an Android uh, user, if you're not non-Apple user, it's almost guaranteed you're using Android. Um, they run off Android. They're uh, moderately powerful for a desk for a, for a laptop or desktop machine. Okay, so what what you're, they're going to get is a good, solid, very fast piece of equipment. Uh, they're light. They're very small, so you can take them anywhere. Uh, the the battery charge can be phenomenal, like ten hours or more on some of these things. Um, and you have free options for some software. And I'm going to talk about that in the next slide here in a moment. Okay, but. Um, they're just a really inexpensive way to go. I've looked at them for my kids because, you know, kids are going to drop them and break them. They're that inexpensive, right? Um, maybe a couple hundred bucks, for, even for a decent one with a keyboard. And this could be something that is a, a maybe a gateway for town officers who don't want to spend a lot of money on this stuff, but they want to start seeing if they can move to more digital records, more communication by email, less paper, okay? Uh, that kind of thing, all right? So alternatives as far as software. Um, of course, there's Microsoft Office. That's kind of the standard these days, but there's a cost to it. You don't get it for free. So one of them that I have used and uses some success is Google Office Suite. There's a free version that anybody can get with a Gmail account. And then there's a paid business option. And it's not, not terrible on that either. Okay. These are, are interesting. They're, they're, for the most part, you're going to be doing anything you can do with Microsoft Office or one of these other methods. Okay. Um, you can have it run in the cloud or you can have it run locally on the machine. You can do it either way. And there's a kind of seamless backup with some of these things. Okay. So that's an option. There's also a freeware. I've got this on my personal machine at home. It's called LibreOffice because I don't want to pay for Word, right? I don't want to pay for Microsoft. This is a free uh, piece of technology that, that people have put together. It looks very similar to some older versions of Word. So you look at it and maybe think, oh, I kind of know this layout because this is what Word used to look like. There are many others available too uh, for low or no cost. But what to look at is privacy policy. What are they letting you do? Because free rarely means free. And, and I'll admit that with Google, free doesn't mean free. They're mining your data most of the time. They see what you have and then they give you ads, right? Ads pop up related to the words in your searches, the words in your documents. Okay, they're making money off you somewhere. Okay, you're, if it's free, it means you're the product. That's the saying. Okay, so be aware of it, know what it is. And then back up, back up, back up, back up. Uh, yeah, over, we, we say this over, and Mark Lanterman talked about this uh, yesterday. You need to have a strategy to back up. You can do this automatically with some of these. Uh, some of these other options out there um, uh, are, are, are take more effort, but they're just as important to do. Okay, passwords. Um, passwords are just as important. And that's why I've done this one again. And, and if you were in a presentation of mine, maybe three years ago, you saw the same thing. This is a, a, a pictorial that illustrates how uh, passwords work. And in the top, you have all this complicated thing based off the word troubadour 83. So somebody who's a minstrel, a uh, modern name minstrel who was born in 83, probably, right? Um, and well, it, it goes through what happens with this. And well, it's not a person guessing your passwords, it's computer guessing, okay? And, and it tells you, well, it'll take a, a, a computer about three days to break a password like that. And then on the bottom, though, you have just four random words that they took. And it says that same machine, that same computer running the same way would take 550 years, okay? So passwords are important. It should be something that's hard for a computer to guess, not something that's hard for a person to guess, because that's not the threat. You can use tools uh, like uh, I go to random word generators uh, online. You just give me four random words, five random words, six random words. Uh, if I have to add in special characters and numbers, you do that too, okay? But otherwise you get these long strings of characters and you have good passwords. Uh, how do you remember all these? I don't, 
there's there's password lockers and generators and I've put some of the products there keep one one password is a, a common one last pass is another I personally use key pass and then one I read about yesterday I was in the news yesterday is another good option is called Bitwarden. Um, I've heard of it I just didn't list it on here but as it's in the news Bitwarden's another one out there okay but the idea is you you create one master password and then in here you have all of your other passwords so you never repeat a password that's one of those things i i didn't catch if mark said it but I, I i imagine he would tell you don't repeat passwords because once they know one they can get in all kinds of things okay so still important to make sure you have this and if it's a town a piece of property it can't be one person that has it it's got to be a couple people right because if the clerk isn't available to use the password to open the machine well the treasurer probably needs it or the supervisors okay so there's got to be a way of sharing that and with these password lockers you can you can share the, the shared locker for somebody okay and they can see okay this is our township password locker and occasionally they may have to update the master password right but the point being you have a method of doing this and and more than one person can get into it backup options. This was interesting. It's uh, from the federal CISA office. It's the Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency, federal office. And they had this, this, uh, this resource that's freely available. I put the link on and they have, this is their strategy that they recommend. A three, two, one rule, three copies of any important file, one primary and two backups. Two, you keep the files on two different media types. So not two backups on the same hard drive, okay? But you, you have your backups in different places, right? And then one copy offsite. That's what they're saying. And, and this might be the clerk and the treasurer exchanging information, uh, exchanging backups from time to time. Okay. Maybe it's you have two thumb drives, and at each meeting, you you each of you pass each other the other one, and and it gets backed up each month, back and forth. Okay. Um, and that way, if you lose something, it's there available for you. You can use on-site or remote versions. Um, Microsoft uses the uh, OneDrive is what they call it nowadays, and it, you can set it up seamlessly so that everything on your machine goes to OneDrive. Uh, it works, works fairly well. I've used it before. Okay, That's the cloud approach, but you do have to have internet at least sometimes for it to take the backup. And then there's schedule and separation responsibilities. Um, oh, I'm sorry. That's there's there's technology there's software that will schedule it for you and do it on a schedule but i'm also saying set a schedule whether that's every month or whatever you guys are going to do and then give more than one person this responsibility some kind of checkup okay last on this stuff use a professional um this is this is a cost of doing business okay uh and as you you move into digital records and all this stuff there's a lot more out there it's your data too so it's important that you take some some responsibility to protect your stuff just as much as the town stuff right um professional help is not expensive and i did find from size of this this um uh, it's called a cyber hygiene service and it is free to local governments and i haven't i found it the other day i don't know any local government that's done it yet so if somebody does this I, i'd love to hear how it went and uh, what they did, how they did it, and whether it was effective, you feel, in, in securing things. Um, because I'm curious what, what it is they're doing and, and how much this is going to help uh, local governments, okay? This should be a line item in the budget to make sure you have uh, funds available to handle something like this, okay? Um, small town doesn't mean we're, we're too small for that. We're too, uh, uh, we don't do that because we're too small of a town because um, this is not backward or unsophisticated. Some townships have the best broadband in, in Minnesota, okay? Uh, I mean, as good as anywhere in the world if it's fiber. So you have all the same potential as anybody else and the tools are becoming cheaper and easier to use. So um, it doesn't have to be a, a, a fast adoption of these things, but over time, plan for it plan to get help and put it in the budget, okay? So with that, I'm gonna exit out of my share here and I'm gonna take some questions. All right, so first, should the township have a contract with the fire department and our budget from the fire department? Okay, if, uh, and so I thought I typed an answer. I'm sorry if I didn't type an answer. I thought I did earlier, okay. If, uh, if your township contracts for service, it should have a written contract and most fire departments will provide that because they're interested in getting it recorded that way too. If your town happens to have the fire department, you can't contract because a department of, a, of an entity of a township or a city, they don't have independent authority. They're kind of like, you treat them like a child. I know that I don't mean to be disrespectful here, but a child can't 
um, contract. They don't have capacity to contract. Well, it's the same idea. Your, your subgroups themselves don't have independent authority to contract. The board, the township contracts, okay? So the township board would have the ability to contract, but not the fire department that it is, uh, you know, has its, it as its department, okay? So uh, a budget is certainly appropriate, whether you're contracting for or, or one that you have in your own township. Okay. The county setup of the Board of Equalization at the town hall, but we are going to change it to a teleconference meeting. Can I publish the meeting at the town hall, but just post the change to the teleconference meeting? Um, if it require, I think it requires publication, you should publish notice of how it's going to go, because I believe that's what's required for the Board of Equalization. You should also post it, um, but but always uh, refer back to the original method that requires in statute. Okay, Curtis, if the treasurer is doing work with an excavator and trucks for the township, do they need a 6,000? 6, and if it's a big job, what's the number of dollar amount that would need to be posted for bids? All right, two questions. We have a conflict question and a bid question or a contracting question. All right, um, if the treasurer is doing manual labor or is an employee of the excavating company, there's a separate provision in, in 471.88, I think it is, 88 or 89, uh, about what you do if you're in the employee of, of a company contracting with the town. And we'd have to go take a look at that. I just don't remember the rule. I think it's very similar where we acknowledge the conflict and then allow it and just so it's out there. It's a, we know it's there, but but they're not making the contract. So they're not involved in getting more money for themselves or their, or their employer. Okay. If they're just a line worker, okay, or he's sitting and doing uh, accounting for the for the excavator, we don't have a problem. We just go through this little process to recognize it. All right, separately, contracting. If you uh, bid is a very special word in contracting law. The contracting law is 471.345. And a bid is required, a sealed bid is required for contracts expected to be more than $175,000. So that's where you would need a bid, okay? Um, I suspect there may be more on that one, Curtis, but give us a call and we'll go deeper into the contracting issues. Does the township have to have a letter asking for a donation? Not at all. Um, the board, the board, only the board spends the money. So they could do that with someone approaching them verbally at a meeting, or they could do that with a letter or a report. But in any event, the board can't make an expenditure, which includes donations, unless they have a statute and a public purpose that they can explain in writing. Can we get SAFE's update to Google Sheet? SAFE's updated to Google Sheet. Stacy, I don't know what that is. I'm gonna need more explanation. If you type more for me, I'll try to get to it. Back to the oath of office, I wanna make sure I understand correctly. For a deputy, either clerk or treasurer, can the oath of office be given by any notary public like a bank or law firm? Yeah, because any notary public, any ex officio notary, or any appointed or elected official of the state or a political subdivision can give an oath. Okay, so the short answer is yes, longer as there's lots of people who can give an oath. What statute requires board members to be paid monthly and not quarterly? There is none if you're talking about the wage theft law. As a best practice, pay everybody monthly. I know townships don't always do that. We can't make you do it or something, so, so they do. Um, but the wage theft law is one that can make you do this, okay? Um, that applies to employees. And I touched on this earlier. Uh, if a board member, uh, supervisor, okay, if we're talking supervisors, if they're only doing elected duties, you, they're, they're not subject to wage theft law because they're not an employee. They're an officer and that's different. Now, if you have a clerk or treasurer and they happen to be appointed, as in option B, never elected, okay, um, always appointed, you treat them like an employee. You, you must pay them every month, at least once every 31 days under wage theft, okay? Employee means different things for different statutes and for this one, that's how we parse that one out. Can a uh, packet on a website, can packet be on website to access by supervisors and residents during their electronic Zoom meetings and not a physical packet? Yeah, Nancy, so when we were doing 
electronic meetings, we have to have another method of providing the public packet. That is one method that can be uh, used. You can have it remotely, something like that. Okay. All right, that is all the questions I have. So um, thank you all for hanging on. I, I'm, I'm, we must have held your attention because we have about the same number of people still on as we had before and that's promising. It means we didn't drive you away or give you the excuse of it was supposed to be done at one. So um, thank you folks for, for joining us today. Um, Curtis, I had just, it just says email. Curtis, give me a call. We'll work through it that way. Um, I'm a little confused about it. But uh, folks, thanks you for joining to, for joining us today. Uh, we have, uh, um, these will be repeating, so um, you can certainly catch them again, but they'll also be online later. And uh, as we're um, able to, to uh, let you go into other rooms this year, you can catch supervisor presentations next week as well on Tuesday if you missed anything from this past week or look at the recordings. So thank you again for uh, joining us today and uh, look forward to seeing you in another training. Okay, that concludes our presentation today. So I'll be ending the call as a reminder of this recording and all the handouts will be available on the MET website and they'll be emailed out to our master list when, when it's all ready. Thanks again. <laughs>